Hello, the next episode is Eumaeus. I think you're going to find this episode pretty accessible, along with the uh, first section of Nausicaa. This is one of the maybe easiest sections in the book, and it is the first of the final three episodes, which are known as the Nostos or Nostos. I'm not sure the pronunciation of that, but it means in Greek, homecoming. This is going to be basically uh, Leopold Bloom or in the Odyssey, Odysseus is getting back to his home island and uh, Ithaca and meeting his wife again and his son. In the book, Bloom is going to be returning home. He's meeting and encountering Stephen. They're going to be talking quite a bit in this episode. So this is what the book has been leading up to in many ways throughout the entire novel. We're finally here, but there's going to be, Joyce is going to have fun with that and make it not as uh, quite as satisfying or as... Um, quite what we expect. Remember at some point long, long ago, I mentioned Joyce's way of writing is to give you things for the most part as they happen rather than providing narration and explaining the meaning. I had forgotten about this episode in which Joyce does do a lot of that. He does explain almost to the point of eliminating a lot of that ambiguity and taking away a lot of the poetic license that he that he does in more of his, you know, quote-unquote typical style. This is, uh, I'm going to explain what I think the style is later on, but it can be connected with Bloom and with journalism, and it, it just has a very almost dumbed-down feel to it in which the narrator avoids uh, l allowing you to find the meaning yourself. He, he almost goes out of his way to say, this is what this means, this is what this means. And he still manages to insert uh, some mysteries that we'll talk about, but it is for the most part a much different style from, say, for example, look at Nestor, a very different style. Also a much less frantic energy. This is the early hours of the morning now, and most people are off the streets, either going home, and there's a few people like Stephen who are drunk and recovering, but by and large, most of the people, the, the town is starting to quiet down, and it's, it just has a much quieter feel. There's not going to be heavy conflict, or um, any conflict is going to be very limited and verbal for the most part, and we're not going to have any of that uh, aggressive energy that we've been seeing since... I don't know, way back since Sirens or so. Back in the Odyssey, Eumaeus is this swineherd who worked for Odysseus. And when Odysseus finally, after all his many adventures, the Trojan War and then all these magical, mysterious adventures in the ocean and so on, he finally makes it back to Ithaca. And the first person he encounters is Eumaeus, who uh, he... Odysseus decides to, you know, scope the situation out first. So rather than say, hey, I'm Odysseus and I'm back, he decides to dress as this beggar. And Eumaeus, though, he, he even though he's a beggar, he, he welcomes him in and he, and he lets him have some food and they talk. And Eumaeus tells stories about Odysseus, what a great man he was. So by this, Odysseus learns secretly that Eumaeus is still loyal to him and he can trust him. And then Telemachus is going to be coming back to the island too. Basically, long story short, Odysseus reveals to those two men that he is indeed Odysseus. And they plan, they come up with this plan, how they're going to go back to Odysseus' home and clean out all these uh, vile suitors who have been just lingering in Odysseus' home, trying to win the hand of marriage of Penelope, Odysseus' wife. They've been just there for... I want to say years, just kind of lingering, saying, you need to marry one of us because your husband's dead. But anyways, Odysseus is like, well, that's not going to fly. And he plans with Eumaeus and Telemachus, his son, and his swineherd, this guy that worked for him, how they're going to destroy the suitors. This episode is going to pick up right after the end of Circe. And you remember the last thing that happened really was uh, Stephen got punched in the face by that private car guy. And he's just really in bad shape. So Bloom, once he gets him on his feet, he says, like, you know what we can do? Why don't we walk over to this cabman's shelter and you can recover there, get something to eat, something to drink. What this cabman's shelter is, is basically a place late at night, early hours in the morn, where, like, people that drive the cabs, maybe between 
taxi rides when they're giving people rides home late at night. They can need to rest, they need to like eat, drink, uh, whatever, and just relax. So this is where they go. It's not very exotic by any means. Here's a picture of one. Bloom knows about this one. They head over to this one. It's near Butt Bridge. One little detail about their condition. He's talking about Bloom and Stephen, and the text says both of them being ED ed, particularly Stephen. Like you, I'm guessing, I had no idea what ED ed means. It apparently means exhausted or worn out. And I was kind of curious. I did some Googling to try and discover what is the origin of this. It was very uh, unclear. The nearest I could tell is that it's from the 1920s is the first appearance of it. And it's somehow derived from the word exhausted. I don't know why you would say ED ed instead of exhausted, but that is what I came across in my, my uh, endeavors. The reason I bring it up though is it has, it's almost can be isomorphically mapped to uh, that other phrase, UP up. It reminded me a lot of that. I don't know if there's any connection in any way, but I just thought it was kind of a Joyce being so aware of language and his puzzles. I feel like he must have been aware that there is a very similar uh, structure to those two phrases or words, whatever they are. On their way to the cabman's shelter, the two men are going to be discussing how they spent their day and that evening before they they met at the hospital, and Bloom is going to be giving Stephen some kind of gently trying to advise him that maybe your current group of friends is not the greatest uh, group of amigos to be hanging out with. And Bloom kind of, not Bloom, Stephen kind of agrees. And when they talk about Lynch, the only one that managed to make it with Stephen to the brothel, uh, even him, Stephen uh, disparages when he, when he kind of abandoned him. He refers to him, he says, and that one was Judas. So maybe even Stephen sees himself as a Christ figure, but at least he's aware of the state of things and he feels like he's being crucified for his art somehow. Maybe it's just a question of whether he cares enough or like Hamlet, he does not set his life in a pin's fee. Bloom also has some uh, interesting commentary on the police who he's not particularly fond of. Never on the spot when wanted, but in quiet parts of the city, Pembroke Road, for example. The guardians of the law were well in evidence. The obvious reason being they were paid to protect the upper classes. Another thing he commented on was equipping soldiers with firearms or sidearms of any description liable to go off at any time, which was tantamount to inciting them against civilians should by any chance they fall out over anything. Police brutality, abuse of power, gun violence, many of the things that, again, we still have with us today, of course. They pass this sentry box, which is basically a security guard-like position, and Stephen, as they pass it, something like almost like deja vu seems to uh, flicker in his mind's awareness in his dazed state. He began to remember that this had happened, or had been mentioned as having happened before, but it cost him no small effort before he remembered that he recognized in the sentry a quantum friend of his father's, Gumley. If you are confused, when did this happen? What is he referring to? It happened way back in Eolus when they were talking about the Phoenix Park murders and Skin the Goat. Skin the Goat, Mr. O'Maddenberg said, fits Harris. He has that cabman shelter, they say, down there at Butt Bridge. Hollowhand told me. You know Hollowhand. Hop and carry one, is it? Miles Crawford said. And poor Gumley is down there too, so he told me. Mining stones for the corporation. A night watchman. Stephen turned in surprise. Gumley, he said. You don't say. A friend of my father's, is it? Never mind Gumley, Miles Crawford cried angrily. Let Gumley mind the stones. See, they don't run away. Funny how he was curious about Gumley at the time, but now that he's actually possibly encountering him, he wants to avoid him. I think he wants to maybe keep his father from hearing any news of him. Speaking of Skin the Goat, Fitzharris, as he is, his name is, he is actually, um, we mentioned him before as driving the, uh, the getaway uh, carriage in the Phoenix Park murders. I think he went to prison, I want to say for like 20 years or so, but I don't think he is actually involved in the murders, just the, the driving. But he is the one they suspect is going to be running this cabman shelter that they're heading to. And the text is very uh, unclear whether it actually is him. Now, it kind of seems to be confirmed that it's him, but 
never 100%. As Stephen and Bloom are walking, there's this guy that approaches them. His name is Corley. That name may ring a bell with you. He's from uh, a short story in Dubliners. Uh, it's called Two Gallants. And that was the story where this guy Corley and Lenahan, they were just kind of two rogues that kind of, as we've seen in this book, uh, Lenahan doesn't really do much in the way of work. He just kind of grifts and drifts around and Corley is somewhat similar. Anyways, um, in that story in Two Gallants, he manages to extract some money from this woman he's seeing. But anyways, in this book, Ulysses, he's still down on his luck. He's kind of hard up for cash. And when he runs into Stephen, he's like, hey, I'm, I'm not doing too well. And Stephen is sympathetic and he managed to, to get a, a bit of a handout from Stephen. When Bloom learns about this, you can tell he's kind of like, ah, why are you giving your money away? But he doesn't say so directly, but he just kind of hints like, you know, everybody's down on your luck. Where are you going to sleep tonight for that matter? Why are you giving out money when you don't even have a place to sleep? I think Bloom generally has a good eye for uh, judging people and sizing them up and can tell who is a parasite, such as this Corley guy. And the thing, though, that's worth noting here is that Stephen, when he's talking to Corley, says, hey, if you're looking for a job, check in uh, this school I'm working at down in Sandy Cove in a day or two. There's going to be a vacancy. So somehow Stephen seems to have uh, decided to quit that position. And when he was talking with Mr. DC that morning, he made no mention of this. So, and Mr. DC didn't either. So it seems like this is some recent uh, resolution that Stephen has come to about quitting that job. Another thing to notice, Corley and Stephen are talking at a distance from Bloom. Bloom's away from them a bit. So they're talking in isolation. And when they're talking, Corley sees Bloom at a distance and he mistakes him. He thinks he kind of recognizes him as somebody who knows somebody named Boylan. And I think this is a different Boylan. It could be the same Blaze as Boylan, but I, I think it's a different Boylan. But anyways, Corley sees Bloom. He says, hey, he knows this Boylan guy who's in the adverta advertising business. Maybe he can give me a job as one of those sandwich board guys, those guys that wear a sign on the front and the back, just walking around advertising things. Maybe I can get a job that somehow that way. But anyways, when Stephen returns to Bloom, he mentions this to Bloom and says, he says, you know, some guy named Boylan. He asked me to ask you to ask somebody named Boylan, a bill sticker, to give him a job as a sandwich man. And <laughs> I love this part because we don't entirely really get to see Bloom's reaction, but I think we can imagine what is going on through his mind as somebody's saying, bringing up Boylan, the name that he's tried to avoid all day, and it just keeps hounding him no, no matter where he goes. And Bloom is also, as I said, perturbed that Stephen should part with his money when he has no place himself to sleep that night, Bloom says. But talking about things in general, where, he added with a smile, will you sleep yourself? Walking to Sandy Cove is out of the question, and even supposing you did, you won't get in after what occurred at Westland Row Station. What exactly did occur at uh, Westland Row Station between Mulligan, Haynes, and Stephen? It's still kind of foggy. We don't know the exact details, but uh, the narrator says that Bloom was still thinking of the very unpleasant scene at Westland Row Terminus when it was perfectly evident that the other two, Mulligan, that is, and that English tourist friend of his, who eventually euchred their third companion, were patently trying as if the whole ballet station belonged to them to give Stephen the slip in the confusion, which they did. Bloom also tries to steer Stephen towards his family and trying to reconcile somehow between Simon Dedalus and Stephen Dedalus and Stephen's family. But uh, you can tell that Stephen is pretty cranky as he's sobering up. You can tell that however much they uh, Bloom tries to get them on the same wavelength that Stephen just kind of ignores him or gets irritated or somehow misunderstands him and has his own thoughts going on. It's um, not quite the, the um, I don't know, harmonious interaction that we expected between father and son that you may have been expecting based on the Odyssey or based on what we've uh, 
kind of as the two characters have navigated closer and closer together throughout the day, it's never going to be quite this, uh, this happy reconciliation that you might have been hoping for.